This is People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm Kurt Karstensen. This is episode 32 with Brian Pyatt. Brian is a college friend of mine from St. Cloud State University, but like is happening, it seems like lately, someone I haven't seen in person in many years. So we spend the first segment, the first, I think, 35, 40 minutes kind of catching up and some of the things that I really think are interesting about him. He's on CARE 11 in the Twin Cities, in the NBC affiliate, and has been a news reporter there for some time, has transitioned a little bit lately. But we get into some of that stuff that I, I think is really interesting because I haven't talked to him in so long about it. But then in the personal growth segment, we get into some things that really demonstrate how I was wrong about one big thing in particular that I think I was wrong about. And it was Brian that was the person, the first person really to cause that, that shifted my mind. And I love that I can talk to him about it and then have you listening to have an opportunity to really show how big of an impact this was in my life. And maybe in some way it'll connect with you as well. I don't know. But my hope is by putting this out to the world, people that have impact in my life or impact in my thinking, it might also be able to, in some way, do something valuable for you. As always, I've put links in the show notes. It'll be ways there for you to learn more about some of the things that we discuss in this episode. And I'll recap it all at the end. And one of the things I've been doing most episodes, this one as well, there's video segments of the Being Wrong segment that you'll find online on the Facebook and now Instagram pages for People I Know show, but also the YouTube channel. I'm trying to work all that in. I'm one person doing this podcast and I'm learning some things. And if you have any advice, I'd be happy to hear it, connect with me in any of those platforms. And I'd be very happy to hear what information you have that might be useful to me in helping this show grow. But for now, let's get into my conversation with Brian Pyatt. I'm joined today by Brian Pyatt. Brian, I remember you as Ice Side reporter Brian yes. Pyatt. It's like a blast from my past right there. And I don't think I've seen you since I was, I was thinking through it. I couldn't think of anything more recent than us running a 5K in memory of mm -hmm. our, our St. Cloud State friend, uh, Tyler Bieber. And I, I know we ran a few of those back in the early part of this decade, but it's been a while and I don't know that I've seen you since then. Do you think you've seen me since one of those? I don't know. I was trying to think about that too. I feel like I see you often just because of like social media. I feel yep. like that's kind of what we all deal with where it's like I know kind of what's going on in your life. But it, I think it was probably and, that, and it's been a few years since we did one of those. So this is a, a long overdue catch up for us. It is. So a little background for the audience. I'm sure... <laughs> Some of the Minnesota listeners have seen CARE 11, and you've been on that local NBC affiliate, I'm guessing, and you tell me precisely, but I'm, my guess is like eight years. It's about right, yeah. 2011, I started yeah. there. So good math. It's very impressive. I, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I look back, and it, in, in so many ways, it feels like it was literally a lifetime ago that I started there. I got hired as the morning reporter. I was at, I, before that, I was at a station in Austin, Minnesota, kind of the Rochester market down there and was anchoring a morning show and literally never thought I would have the opportunity, at least at that point in my career, being that young to, to get a you job. You were so young. That a, was, was like 26 so years it. old. Yeah. And I, I literally just like randomly set up an interview with or uh, like a meeting with the news director there um, at CARE 11 just to introduce myself and found out that. They were hiring for a morning reporter in that process. And then like one thing led to another and I was hired at CARE 11 and I was literally like pinching myself. I couldn't believe it. I remember because we went to St. Cloud State at the same time and I was a senior your freshman year, I believe. Mm. So you would have went there in the fall of 2005. Uh, yes. It was your first year yes. and I graduated in spring of 06. 2004. So maybe. I graduated, well, I graduated high school in 2004. Okay. So maybe. So maybe you weren't in their first year when I was in my senior year. Yeah, so we might have been like there a couple were, years. Yeah, I feel like you were like not a senior yet. Okay, so it's two years. We we yeah. overlap two years in at St. Cloud State. Yeah. If, if our remember our memory math. of our, our years are correct. Yeah. And I I remember you coming in as just as a freshman, just like being really involved right away with being on air and getting some fairly good for like college campus TV station. You. You got some gigs within that that were pretty good, and you were active from the beginning. 
Yeah, I, I, I remember. I th- so I think we met at it was KVSC. I think it was like our first. Maybe I remember you as yeah. the guy that like trained me in at KVSC Probably. to do like football and and different sports like teching games. I feel like you like taught me all of that stuff. I yeah, the person I, in the studio when there was a game on site somewhere, someone has to be in the studio to yeah. like run all the promos and everything else yeah yeah so you were like the guy yeah. that knew everything at the radio station you're were, you were a young kid that was getting doing what anyone should do if they're trying to get into broadcasting yeah. is go to a school that has like hands-on opportunities and you just you did you did radio you did tv did you ever do the newspaper stuff at all i did not do it was the chronicle, chronicle. Right? i don't think i ever did anything with with the newspaper, I think I was all yeah. I started off at KBSC, the radio station, doing sports because I was all about sports. Um, that was kind of my goal going into college. And then it was my sophomore year, I think, that I started to get more involved at UTVS, okay. the TV station. And it was like Husky Mag. We worked on that show together. Didn't you work on Husky Mag? Yeah, no. And I found a photo in, in preparation for talking to you of us together. We you filled in once or a couple times as the yes. Husky Mag. So we're behind a desk looking very young. You still look young. And sometimes people tell me I look young, but yeah. we look really young in this photo. And this photo will be yeah. as a part of the Facebook and Instagram posts that I make. And, Isn't and it so funny? Association with this episode. Up. Yeah, that's, yeah, we're, it's, it's so long ago. And, but I, know. I don't know, something, it's just, life's kind of weird. It is. And, but we haven't seen each other in so long either. And it's kind of strange because we've been in the same city area for a while. And mm-hmm. which is another reason. And every time I have someone on that, represents this on the podcast i just love that i'm doing this because i'm I'm, i would have seen you eventually it's one Mm -hmm. of these things i'm sure but Mm -hmm. we've never made a point to get together to like just you and i and we're hanging out together talking and recording so it's a little bit different but we (laughs) haven't made a point of doing this and all the time that we've been near each other but i think for the most part you keep pretty busy and i do i and we just haven't prioritized life just gets busy I know. And I, and I was so excited when you reached out. Um, I saw that you were doing the podcast. I think it's awesome. Um, and I feel like, yeah, any time to like sit down and, and catch up and be part of what you're doing here with the podcast. I'm just like honored that you asked me and let's chat, right? Yeah, so and record everything. Yeah, record that's how we everything. catch up nowadays. I think put so. Put a mic in front of us. Yeah, because <laughs> it, it, it's already clear that our memories aren't as good as they maybe once were. I so know, at right? least At least we can always re- go back to the recording of our memories oh, yes. to see if we actually remembered anything in the future. St. Cloud State. So you graduated there, must have been right at the end of the decade or so. So I graduated, yeah, it was 2008. Graduated, mass comm, broadcast journalism major. And then I, yeah, graduated and then went to Mankato. That was I my remember first seeing you stop. in Mankato. Yes. A couple times, once or twice, when I was doing some work in there or with the, the Northwoods League That's when I right. was living oh out of God. Rochester. Kurt, I totally forgot about this. Oh, you were you with the Beatles. No, I, I worked right? in the Northwoods League front office for six seasons, five and a half years, and I probably was in Mankato for a Moondogs yeah. game, and I knew you were there, so I made a point to see you maybe after one of your newscasts. I think we went out to one of the yeah. the Hoppin' Mankato nightclubs. Didn't you work for Alexandria? I did. Yeah, yeah okay. Back, that, okay, I remember yeah. that. That was, that was before you That was during the, the college days. The North, yeah. That, that was my radio broadcasting, or some of some of my main experience was... Yeah calling baseball games for for five summers. And that was the thing. So I worked for the St. Cloud River Bats in college. Mm-hmm. So I interned for them. Yeah, it was just one season. I was like their media relations oh, yeah. intern. So I'd see you at the ballpark. Yeah, so I would see you there so too. We'd That's cross right. paths a lot. All these That's... things are coming back to me now. I forgot about that whole stint in the Northwoods League. You and I, I haven't again. done anything related to mass communications broadcasting in so many years that we wouldn't have crossed paths as mm-hmm. much then in recent years, but now I'm doing this. So now it gives us a reason to yeah. specifically get together. I love it. Yeah. So I graduated college, went to Mankato, worked at KUIC. So that was my first job out of college. It was a weekend anchor at, um, at the, the TV station. They're the only TV station in Mankato. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, I get to be an anchor like right out of college. This is, this is awesome. I was super duper excited about that. And then I was there for, about a year i think it was just under a year and then i got the job down in austin minnesota anchored um at k-a-a-l it's like the hardest call letters to say ever you still always have to say k-a-a-l tv.com i did that for a couple years Yep, and i that was in my market when i was living in rochester so i would watch you yeah like right away when i knew you were there i know i'm sure i was watching you and i Mm -hmm. watch 
and I had uh, Steph McPhail on previously, Steph Anderson of the, oh, in those yes. days. So I'd watch her. And all my my friends KGDC. from college would come into my market, and I'd every time I'd have an opportunity to watch you on the TV, I would yeah, I'd watch. It'd be so cool to see you guys like you know getting out on a real TV station at that time. Yeah, but but it, and it, it was amazing getting out into the real world like how actually pretty similar it was to like what we were doing in college. I was always so blown away by that. Like it was just such a good program at St. Cloud state that got us so ready to be out in the real world. And we saw that with just like so many of our classmates getting jobs left and right. And it was so cool to see everybody branching out and doing their own thing. And, it's it's been a neat thing to kind I of think track the St. Cloud State Mass Comm Department could use a, a part of this, at least a piece of this podcast, probably. To <laughs> yeah, it's a promotional because it's, video. It was. I, there's just so much opportunity there, and the people that I think the people that do the most, the quickest, or get the furthest are the ones that just get involved with everything. And so true. And you seem to. And I, I was really. That's that's a point in my life where. We'd be full-time students, and then especially my senior year, I was really involved in UTVS, the TV station, and I think four nights a week, I was working on something there, so most days, I would get to campus at like 8.30 in the morning, maybe, Mm -hmm. and I would leave at like 9 or 10 o'clock, and that would just be the day. It'd be a normal day. I wasn't making any money doing any of this, and that was fine. Just You'd spend Mm -hmm. the whole day doing all these things, and that's just the life, and that's kind of cool, and it's fun. You get up in the morning, you're excited about it. Mm-hmm. Not not dreading it anyway because you like the people you're around, and then the weekends would probably party a little bit, and it's just yep. that was the year, and that would be the every day of the week, every year or the entire yeah. year, and that was normal and it was fun, which has helped me moving forward in those moments where I have to work really long days, realize mm-hmm. okay, I can start early, I can go all day, and it's it's okay, I've done it before for, without pay. So if I'm, someone's paying me to do something, then that's even more incentive to be able to put in the 13, 14 hour days or whatever it takes some days. It's like a little bonus that you're yeah. actually getting paid. Hey, for money. That. Hey, look at that. That, that. that helps for sure. And just the deep connections, I think, and all the friendships that came out of the work that we did because we we spent so much time together because I know like I produced that show Husky Mag, which for people listening that don't know what that is, it was like a sports show we covered st cloud state athletics and it was like the st cloud state version of sports center and we would like work over like i remember being in the newsroom working until like two in the morning you know like with people and we just developed these really cool connections and i i absolutely feel like my life kind of or my my college experience took such a, a turn for the better once i got involved in utvs and started meeting people and those still to this day are some of my dearest friends you know, I look back, it's just it's such good memories. At the beginning of this conversation, I called you Ice Side Reporter Brian Pyatt. And now I realize because you and it was your first or second year, St. Cloud State it was a Husky Productions. They would do the video broadcast of all the home St. Cloud State hockey mm-hmm. games. And that was put out to like charter communications, a lot of places throughout the state. And you were the, the youngest student on the air on that at that time. As the ice side reporter, that's side that's reporter. Where, that's why I always call you that. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't been called that in a long time, oh, so it's it's, it's, it's back. Good. It's like very nostalgic. I like it. Just start putting that on my on my resume more often. To keep bringing that back. I think so. Ice side reporter. Yeah. So I that was oh my gosh, what a what a cool deal for a college student, right? To be part of a broadcast. It's like the first of probably several times in your life that you got opportunities as younger than maybe yes. the average person seems to get these opportunities. Like we did a game, I don't know if it was my first year or my second year that we were doing Husky Productions, but it was on ESPNU. Okay, yeah. And I remember like, oh my gosh, I'm a college student and I'm, you know, part of a broadcast that's nationally televised. I think it was my first season that I was doing doing um Husky Productions. And oh my god, just absolutely phenomenal! So I did two seasons of that, where I got to do like interviews, you know, after the game. I just got you know talk to players, I'd interview Coach Motzko and stuff like that before the game. And then my last season as part of Husky Productions, they actually I was able to be up in the booth doing color commentary with Rob Hudson. So he was the play-by-play guy, and then I did color for a season, and um, it just totally set me up to to have you know where i am now i have I, I have to thank so much to just those opportunities of physically being in front of a camera in college you know we, we weren't learning stuff you know from a textbook right we were actually on the air and then that, that that stuff is just totally valuable and maybe for up. me it's the type of learner i am but that was the stuff that mattered yeah. going going to the classes i some of the classes i guess interconnected with the actual production on say utvs like 
there was news reporting classes that that I was involved in that that helped. But generally, like the class learning didn't, didn't do a whole lot for me. It's mm-hmm. the, but the hands on opportunities there, especially at St. Cloud State, and I'm sure there's other places too that are pretty good. But I, I imagine for the mass com field, that's yeah. Just be involved, get every oppor- take advantage of every opportunity that's around, and then you have a chance to really yep. hit the ground running in the real world. And someone might actually hire you at a young age to be on a major market TV morning show, yep. like yep. they did for you after just what was it, two or three years in smaller market, four years? Yep. How long so was I did. It? So I was three years. So I did the one year in Mankato, and then two years down in Austin, and then and then I got the job at Care. So yeah, 2011 is when I when I stepped into Care 11, and literally was like on cloud nine. Like I could not believe it. Um, and so I did, yeah, I did four years. I feel like I've done so many different things since I've worked at care 11. So I did, I was the morning reporter is what I got hired to do. And usually that consisted of me being the guy that would like go out and do all the silly wacky things on the morning show. Like I, I rode a ride at mall of America, live on tv and i you know like the red bull crashed ice course yeah in saint paul like i skated that like live on tv i watched some i don't know if i watched that one or either of those in particular but i remember yeah the tv in the morning and seeing you is that why they hired you as like a younger guy because you had to i be, have no idea like they, were they able to hire someone 20 years older than you to do the same things i don't think what have they yeah, i don't probably i don't know i honestly have no idea it was it was so different than um you know now at care 11 i mean our morning show has unbelievable amount of resources it's such a high priority show now um not and not that it wasn't a high priority back then i think it was i think there was more and more energy that was starting to get diverted into the morning show but like when i came on there wasn't really like there was um we had a thing called metro mix back then which was like an entertainment sector at care 11 and there was um shane wells was her name she used to do some live shots for for the morning show kind of sporadically here and there and and she did an awesome job but she wasn't like regularly on the show and when they brought me on they didn't really have like a permanent like regular morning reporter so i was kind of the only i I came on and i would so like one day i would be skating the red bull crashed ice course and then the next week i'd be like covering you know a fire overnight or, or next day i'd be covering like a fire so it was such a I mean, I really learned how to like cover a lot of different types of stories because it was, you know, literally it was like every day was something completely different. Did they have a plan for something kind of silly every day? And then if something more important and more newsworthy yep. came up, they would just yep. they so I used to push set up, that back and send you somewhere more important. Yep. So I would work on like setting up stories. I usually would always have something set up. And, and a lot of times just at that hour of the day, they usually end up being kind of more like lighthearted feature type live shots which is what I've always enjoyed doing more. So it was always, I always felt like um, kind of in my wheelhouse. And, but so I would set a lot of those up and then I would always have to tell people, Hey, we're going to show up at your place at, I mean, cause you're, you're working just ridiculous hours. So I would be like, Hey, you want to do a live shot with us tomorrow morning at like, we're going to show up at like four 30, but I'll call you overnight. If breaking news happens, you know, if, if, if I get you know pulled to a different story. And so that would happen quite often where I'd have to call people like overnight and be like, I'm so sorry, but I, you know, something happened and I got to go cover this. And then you would set this up for another day if it still was relevant. Yep. Yep. And then I would say, Hey, well, we'll try to, I mean, usually we were able to, I mean, sometimes if it was like a day of event that was actually happening that morning, it wouldn't yep. make sense to do it later, but usually we would be able to do that. One of the things that I recall that you, you must've done was, was it like, levitate over water on some sort of machine yes the flyboard flyboard is what that was called unbelievably like i know you see that right and if you've never seen it before it like is like what is happening (laughs) this can't (laughs) actually be be going on it was this thing that would so it, it was hooked up to a jet ski so there was like a tube that was like went from the jet ski to this like contraption that would strap to your feet And then they would like the person on the jet ski would like rev the engine and then it would literally shoot you out of the water attached to this thing called the flyboard. And you would like, I mean, it's like you're flying basically over the water. And then if you like lose your balance, then you kind of like plunge. Is there only one end to this? Do you end up plunging in the water? I mean, I think people are like are pretty like people that practice this all the time. Right. Are probably really good at staying up in the air. But for me, I remember I was we did it on like a like a, a lake it was like and there was, i remember there was like seaweed i was like pulling up like seaweed after i'd like come up out of the water and um but it was it was good tv 
people like that's one thing that i always learned in that show doing those live shots that when everything went perfectly or everything went smoothly like those weren't usually the moments that people remember people remember when you're human you know and you have like these silly when things go wrong i remember i was i was doing a tour through um a, a, a it was good. Bachman's does this thing called the spring ideas home or, and they do them for all these different seasons where they kind of show off different decorating trends and things like that. And I, we used to always do live shots there and I was walking through and I was like, Hey, and let's like walk over here into this room. And I knocked a frame off the window and it like fell on the ground oh, no. on TV. Luckily <laughs> it was like a, it wasn't like glass, which was good. So it didn't shatter. But I mean, those were the moments, right. That I think to this day, they're like the most fun things to talk about, you know, when things go, like, like people enjoy the humanness, I think, especially at that hour of the morning, people just want to like feel good and laugh. And the more that we could just bring some humanness to people's mornings, the better. And you're okay with being ridiculous when needed? When needed. If it makes other people feel good, I'm all or about it. Or on accident, be ridiculous? I'm all about it. Yeah. There was a lot of on accident being ridiculous. You've been in the Twin Cities local TV guy for eight years. Does that mean when you're out and about... What percentage of people <laughs> come up to you and recognize? Or I'm sure more people recognize you than say anything just because mm -hmm. you're a local TV guy. But what percentage of people do you find that you're walking down the street will, will stop and say something? Is like 5%, 10%? It happens, you know where it happens a lot is at like events. So okay. it happens a lot if I'm at like concerts or if I'm at like a like Target Field. I don't know why that is. I've always noticed that like big events, con you know, things like that seem to be where a lot of people will like actually come up and say something to you. I don't know if it's just like the vibe is different, right? Where people are, maybe they've had a few drinks and they're feeling a little like, Oh, I'll just go up and talk, you know, but I, it's, it's, I always love hear, like hearing that from people. I, I don't know like what the actual percentage yeah, I is. Suppose that's a tough you know, I think, I think a lot of people probably, do you feel overwhelmed by it or no. just kind of occasionally? No, I love it. I think it's, I, I just never know. I just never know how to like, respond to it i guess that's where i usually like because I, I never want it to sound like well yes that's me you know <laughs> like i never want to like be that guy i don't do that that's being weird like that but um i, I it, it's always just good to know that people are watching right and that people appreciate what you're doing and that's been always the i, I it always means a lot when people come up and, and just say like hey you know, i used to i used to get that a lot in the morning show you know you just you were i love starting my day with you like what a cool thing to to say that you can do for people because there's a lot going on in people's lives. And, and I, I loved being a part of people's routine because you're, you're truly a part of people's routine specifically in morning news. You're kind of setting the tone for their day and being just a, a piece of people's day like that was always really neat. The one thing that always, here's what happens a lot. I get a lot of people that say, do I know you from somewhere? Or like, or like, gosh, you look so familiar. Like, have we met before? And that sets you up. Cause like, I never know how to respond to that because if I'm the guy that's like, well, I'm on care 11 and then they're like, no, that's not it. <laughs> you know, then you're like, oh gosh, now I just feel ridiculous. So that actually happens more often than. Have that. you learned the best way to proceed with that? I usually just honestly don't say anything unless they make the connection. I guess that it's like a TV thing. I usually will just be like, gosh, I don't know. I don't know if we've ever met. And you know, people will just kind of be like, oh, that's weird. Maybe, maybe we haven't. I, but I, I never want to be the one that's like, you know, hey, I'm on the news because then again, that just do you want a photo with to, me? Yeah. Do you want <laughs> you want a picture with me? I just here's my autograph. I try everything in my power to be to not be that guy. Yeah. Do people ever want photos or autographs with you? Are you are you that level of that's celebrity a, you know, in so Minneapolis? I feel, I feel like autographs are not really a thing anymore. Aren't they? Photos? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's like so I, you know, recently I, I've kind of stepped off the air a little bit more like as of late. So um, I'm not getting as much of that obviously now that I'm not in front of the camera as regularly, but there was, yeah, there was always, there were people that always kind of, yeah, wanted photos. Hey, will you take a picture with, you know, so-and-so or my mom watches you in the morning and I, I got to send this to her and things like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know. Sure. I think some people might think that that gets like annoying or whatever, but it's not. I've, al I've always, I've always really like valued that, that, um, that people, appreciate the work that you do enough to come up and say something and actually want a picture. Yeah, that's neat. And I think just kind of based on my experiences, meeting some people throughout my life, like working in sports, especially there's a lot of relatively famous baseball players that I've yeah. interacted with through the years. 
and I don't forget about that. Then say I'm, I'm watching a game and I see them on TV. I'm, I'll think, oh, yeah, I met that guy and I yeah. remember this interaction in this way. So I'd imagine if someone's a local TV viewer and they can, you pop on, on the TV and like, oh yeah, I remember that time I met yeah. him. And he was really cool. And that makes them maybe want to keep being a fan or, or a, someone that watches care 11 because yeah. they've had a positive real life interaction with someone that's actually on the station. Well, and you always, I mean, that's something that you really have to be mindful of because if you have one day where you're in a really bad mood, right. And somebody comes up and says something to you and you're like short with them or you don't really treat them well they're always gonna remember you as that guy that and then they'll tell people about yeah i was uh, brian pye he's a guy, dick he's a real loser <laughs> don't watch that guy turn off the tv immediately so yeah and i and i i've always tried to be to be careful about that because it, you really even if and i i and I, on, so on the flip side you know you always hear people like having a bad interaction with like somebody that's well known and i i always feel like i take that stuff with a grain of salt as well because we're all human right we all it's might a moment having, in time yeah we all might be having a bad day that's not like a representation of somebody you know in their character because i think uh we're all just doing the best we can you mentioned and i, I guess i don't watch much tv tv at all anymore and so unless i would be watching the Sunday night football or something mm -hmm. on care 11 and they were promoing something. And then and I, I guess I don't remember how much you're on TV <clears throat> these days. Mm -hmm. What, what's the transition been like? And I guess if you can talk about it, like as you look to your future in mm -hmm. this form of, or this, this industry, what, what do you see yourself doing as the years go on now? Yeah, it's a, it's a big question. I, so to go back a little bit, I hopped around and did a whole bunch of things at Care 11. I did, I was the morning reporter. I, um, I anchored the 11 o'clock show, anchored the four o'clock show. I did traffic. So I kind of like bounced around and did all this, these different things. And then like full disclosure, I got a point, I, I got to a point where I being on, in front of the camera for me, like day in and day out, particularly in like a news role, hard news role, got to, got to really start really, really kind of war on me. And I, and I hit a point actually last summer where I was like, I got to make a shift here. Like who I, I think I've been on this big journey of kind of figuring out who I am, like away from being in front of the camera. Like who am I outside of like TV, Brian? Cause that was so incredibly ingrained in just how I, who I was. And I really didn't know who I was away from this like TV personality. Cause I had invested so much time in that, you know, from going to college and, and, and climbing up the, the TV ladder. So I, I went, went to Care 11 and I, I talked to my boss who I, I, I am very, very lucky to have a really good relationship with and told her that I kind of was looking to maybe slide away from being in front of the camera and kind of curious if there were some opportunities for me to do that. And I've moved in now to a more, kind of a producing role for, our, for the morning show, but I don't work morning show hours. So I work like a pretty kind of nine to five job, um, kind of dur during the day working ahead and putting stories together. So I'm doing a lot of shooting video, a lot of editing video, putting together segments that will air in, in later morning shows. And for me, I have realized that I want to be part of, I think, putting out content and putting out things into the world that are, that are uplifting and that are positive and that are, you know, celebrating the good in life and, and, and just real conversations and real, real content. And this has really been a nice step in that direction for me. I think it's allowed me to kind of shed this layer of who I was as TV, Brian, and I'm doing that in quotes. I see you. Hey, okay, good. I'm glad you're here <laughs> to witness that moment. I, think I have it, proof. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it, it's allowing, it's really allowed me to like open up more space in my life to, to really figure out like, what do I want? And then, and, and where do I want to go from here? What kind of stuff do, do I want to be part of creating life is short. Right. And, and, and I think I've really been trying to dive into to that kind of work. And as of late, I think being in front of the camera for me will always be part of what I do for a living because it's something that Right. I have, I've been lucky enough to develop some skill in, right. And it's just kind of in my wheelhouse and I've, um, very lucky to, to be able to do that. Now I think it's just meshing it with a message that feels authentic and feels real and, and is sustainable for me. Cause I think I was kind of on a track there for a little while where it didn't feel very sustainable. I suppose you always have to 
beyond similar to walking at whatever event and someone coming up to you, you, you even though you're human you, you don't want to show them something that's going to make them have a negative interaction with mm-hmm. you you need to present this happy excited to be here and be a part of this and serious about what i'm reporting on mm-hmm. 100 percent of the time even though i'm sure in some cases it doesn't actually make you feel like this is something that's yeah. as as important as the thing we did three days ago or the thing we might be doing tomorrow, mm-hmm. but you still need to present as, yeah. as someone that someone's going to want to turn on the TV and watch. Yeah, and you need to, you know... That's got to be exhausting. Yeah, it is. And but particularly, I mean, it's, it is. It's a lot of... It's a, it became, for me, I can only speak about my own experience, it became really hard for me to to do things in front of the camera that didn't feel authentic, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I... I got really good at for a long time, but just kind of like switching into TV mode and I could do that. Like it was just so second nature for me to kind of almost abandon who I am kind of on the sidelines and then like step in and just do whatever I needed to do to like make good TV. And I feel like as I've gotten older, I've gotten less good at doing that, which I don't think is a bad thing, right? It's like me trying to incorporate more of who I am into my work. I've just, I've kind of, outgrown that ability to just totally be like i don't need to be connected to the work and i can i'll just do whatever i need to do to get like validation and get approval and because the reality is is that being in front of the camera particularly when you're young and you're in a big market and you got this like flashy job and you can say that you work at carol Levin, um is a huge ego boost right and i mean that's just the reality i think there there is an element to that on when you're in front of the camera yeah, for sure there's it's kind of strokes your ego a little bit and I think it's just the reality. It's not a bad thing. At the same time, I think you just have to be really careful that you're not, that, that, that you, that you have some sense of who you are too. And that you're not just so like solely buying into just doing the job just for the approval from other people. And I think for me, it kind of became that for, for a long time. I suppose you were at risk and, and maybe this is you and you can decide if it was or not, or other people in your similar role, you're not you become a t you become a TV character. You're not you're not 100%. having a role in a sitcom or as a drama, but you're still a TV character as yourself yes. because you know that people are watching and you can't always be what you feel at that moment because you need to act. You always gotta act at least a little bit and probably some cases a lot. Yes. You I mean you hit the nail on the head there. I, I that's something I've actually said a lot over the last couple of years to people like that I'm close to in my life. Like I felt like I was playing a character. I felt like I was having to go into that on that set. On your own name, though. Yeah, I mean, it was still me, right? I didn't totally change my name or wear a wig or yeah. something like that or disguise. <laughs> but I, yeah, I felt like I was playing a character. And and that's not to say, I want to be very clear, that, that, that I'm not talking in broad terms about the industry and other people. I mean, th- there are so many people within that building at Care 11 and in this industry that genuinely feel so passionate and they, they are so connected to the work that they're doing as a journalist and hard news and, and you know, all that. I think... Um, that's just not necessarily maybe who I am, right? And, and I'm just trying to kind of develop who who I am and, and what that looks like. And I think I'm stepping in that direction. I'm trying to take some action towards that. But playing a character day in and day out in front of the bright lights on a TV set is very, very draining. How old are you? I'm 33. Okay, and I am 36. And maybe maybe this is coincidence or maybe this is just part of growing up and learning I think when you're younger, you're trying to, I shouldn't say you, people, me, you you try to fit in and figure out how you fit into what you're doing. And then you get to this point where like, I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to be who I am and not worry about being accepted or maybe kind of worry a little bit and then realize I don't need to worry about being accepted or how people perceive me. And maybe it's in the 30s for you and I around the same age where it's Mm -hmm. like, I just I want to do what I'm doing, but do it in a way where I never have to concern myself with what someone else might think about me and just be me and and allow that to make me feel fulfilled and actually do my best work rather than yes. trying to fit this role that I'd created for myself because I thought I had to create a role for myself and yes. it wasn't quite who I was or am at this point. Yes, to all of that. Okay. Couldn't have said it better myself. So are you and I the only people doing this or is this like I everybody? think there I, I I think there's other people out there okay. doing it but it does feel like when you're doing the work like that on yourself it does feel pretty lonely at times I've found 
because sometimes it's like, gosh, everybody else just like has it so easy, right? Now, which I know is not the case. No, I think probably we're all, not. True we're, for all, we're all so good at at putting up a a, a mask and and presenting, always putting our best foot forward publicly, and then you know the internal situation is usually very different for us. But I, yes, I and 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 it was hard. It's hard to shift that gear or, or it's it's hard to make that change when so much of like the momentum in my life had been all about how do how do I look to other people and and how you know what kind of validation is this going to give me or like how, I'm going to look so cool to other people if I have this job and 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 being so like moving in that direction to like actually then say hey I kind of want to like figure out who I really am and like actually start really owning that a little bit more I've kind of turned my back on myself for far too long to start making that shift is not an easy thing to do because there's so much momentum going in that other direction and I think over the last several years I've been very much in this journey of trying to kind of turn the boat around and, and go a little bit more towards me and and not leave myself on the sideline as much and it's a process man I think Maybe some people can do it better or, or, and do it differently than I do. But say, if depending on who I'm around, if these are people that I was around at a different point in my life where I felt like I was a different version of, my, of myself, mm. I feel like it's hard not to revert back to that yes. person because that's the person that all these people know. Mm -hmm. So to be a different person now in front of these people that used to know me, it, it doesn't really make sense to them. It doesn't really make sense to me. And mm -hmm. I think it's easy to revert back to whatever you were in that setting, which is why I find like traveling, for instance, when you're presented with totally new people in a totally new place, mm -hmm. it's easy just to be yourself because there's no one that can possibly have any other assessment of you than what you are at that moment in time. Yes. But if I go back home and say, hang out with some of the people that I knew from high school, they don't know me anymore. I don't know them anymore. Mm -hmm. And in that setting, one on one, I think you can kind of work through that stuff. But if you've got a, a big group, it's like I don't. This is exhausting. Wow. I don't even want to deal with the fact that I'm not. The, I'm not who I used to be, and they're not who they used to be. And yes. I, I just kind of avoid those situations sometimes because that's not who I am anymore. Yep. Isn't it amazing how it's one of the hardest things in the world is just to be ourselves. Why is that so hard? You know, I think that, and maybe it's more difficult for some people than others. I don't know, but I know that that's a huge struggle for me. Just being who I am and authentically, like, what do I want out of life and not being so consumed with other, what other people are thinking and, you know, how am I going to be perceived and, and all of that. It's, it's, it's some of the hardest work, but I think it's some of the best work that we can do on ourselves is, is to figure out what that looks like. I think I've, worked through that pretty well at this yeah. point in my life. Yeah. But in that process, uh, the last few years or a few years ago, I agree with you trying to figure out who that is. Yeah. But if you're trying to figure it out, I don't think that works either. It just, sure. It's just got to happen. You just got to go. Yep. So like this podcast has done many things for me. It just allows me to have my voice in a more natural way, depending on who I'm who I'm talking to and express some of these things when they, when they come up, like I wasn't thinking about talking about this right now, what we just mm -hmm. talked about, but you were explaining what you've been experiencing and it just clicked with me. Oh yeah. I've, I've dealt with that in my own way mm -hmm. and I'm able to express myself based mm -hmm. on what you're dealing with or we're dealing with. And it, it, I think it resonates with both of us. And I imagine there's probably some people listening that it'll resonate with also maybe yeah. pretty much everybody listening. I, I can't say for sure, of course. Yeah. And what was I going to say? I had something really, it was going really to be so profound and it just completely escaped my mind and I cannot remember what it was. Okay. It well, was so entrenched in what you were saying. Wow. I know we're just at a deep level right now, Kurt. It makes me think I had the thought that there was, and I don't know what you think about me at this point. Cause you don't really know me outside of social media yeah. back until you, you knew, a, you knew a past version of me, mm -hmm. Ryan. And I knew a past version of you since yeah. the last time we really had probably a relatively deep conversation. Yeah. I, but I do re vaguely remember those first times meeting you where you were the, the young 18, 19 year old showing up. And I was, if I'm, I guess I'd be three years older, like 22, 21, 22. Mm -hmm. And at that point in that setting, I had a lot of like radio broadcasting experience entering St. Cloud State. Mm -hmm. So I know some of the newer people probably th looked up at me and thought, wow, this guy's done all these things. Yeah. And, and now like that's, but that's so long ago. So there's a time in your life. You probably, I'm guessing, I think I remember you like looked up at me as yeah, like, this oh, guy totally. knows his stuff. Yeah. Wow. That first year I remember you were, 
you were the guy that was teaching me how to do everything at the radio station. And it was like, Oh, like this guy's good. He's got like a good voice and he's calling sports. He knows what he's doing. And totally you were that guy. And for the last decade plus I've ducked out of all that stuff and you've been kind of <laughs> rising and becoming more notable. But now you're at this point where like trying to figure out yourself. Yeah. You're always trying to figure out. I think so. And now some people are very good at acting and, for a much longer time. And I should, and I should clarify that. I don't think like, I think like what you said about figuring trying to figure it out there's nothing to figure out yeah. right like that's so true <laughs> because i think i was i'm very guilty of at times being very like i need to do all this work on myself and then i need to like get to this place and then i'll be like everything will be great and then i'll like start living my life then and i don't think at least for me that that moment has not arrived you know mm -hmm. and I, I don't know that it ever does it's not coming brian and i'm and i'm learning just enjoy your life and right and and then and the shift for me has been you know, learning how to take on uncertainty and struggle and, and, and whatever's going on for me internally and like learn how to like live with it as opposed to like trying to make all the bad stuff go away and be in like a good space. And then now I can start living because and, and that's that's a huge shift for me over the last couple of years is kind of learning to like welcome it all along for the ride and, and be less concerned about figuring things out and just be more concerned about showing up for my life no matter how I'm feeling. Well, let's make a proper transition to some of the things you're alluding to and mm -hmm. move into the personal growth segment. I've found as I've expressed to you a little bit and preparing you to be on the podcast with me and just talking with other people in my life that it's at these conversations that we're having and being very aware that there are things that we can do, need to do to make our lives feel more fulfill, fulfilled and bring more joy to our, our, our lives. And I think we all are in need of this at all times because we always can yes. do better. We can we can feel more strongly and and interact uh, more closely with people that matter to us. And I, I just find that not everyone's probably, no, of course, not everyone's at the same page, but not everyone has figured out how to do more figuring out. Yeah, have, right. have, hasn't like found a way to do this well to really enjoy their existence. And I'm getting better at it. I can get a lot further ahead. But I'm always curious now when I have someone on, what, what are you doing? What You've alluded to something. What, what's been going on that you... You think you're actually making specific progress. What steps do you take? What steps could you advise someone else on taking maybe to, yeah. to be a better version of yourself that you seem to be in search of and yeah. are beginning to find? Um, so much. So I, what I mentioned before as far as really this shift in, in not trying to get myself to a place where it's all like rainbows and butterflies and then now i can start living my life like learning how to just be less interested in that and more interested in just showing up for my life that's been just kind of a big like fundamental change for me i and i know i think we're going to talk about the refresh network a little bit here at some point but um i have felt super passionate about um really just trying to understand like my own mental health that has been a, a big thing that i've struggled with a lot in my own life and and I've been on a real journey there. And, and a lot of that stuff, like the details of that are still a little bit hard to talk about. Um, but I'm getting better at it, mm -hmm. you know, learning how to like open up because I do think that's a real thing for a lot of people out there um, that, you know, there's there's some struggles there that are pretty silent and that not a lot of people are um, seeing in the people around them day in and day out. And I think a lot of us that struggle with that stuff kind of feel like we're the only ones. And so I've been on a big journey there. This I'm, I think I oversimplify it, but the things that only exist in our mind and they, they don't exist anywhere else are the things that limit us or kind of destroy us slowly. Mm. And if we let them out of our mind, we realize yes. that we can use them to empower us in some other way. Yes. And just the shame, right? Like I think like not like having stuff in our mind and, and internally that, that, that we're not like maybe shining a little bit of light on can like fester and, and some pretty deep shame. At least I know it has for me. And, and I've been on kind of a journey to, to work through some of that stuff. And I think overall, right. Just like trying to get better at not trying to live for other people and more interested in, in, in living, um, living like who I am and like living my truth and, and stepping into that more. And, and, and I keep saying this like in our conversation, but like not leaving myself on the sideline as much. I got so good at doing that. I could like, I could like, and like I could step into any situation and be 
like kind of describe it as like being like a chameleon, right? Like I could like go into any situation and I could become anybody that you need me to be in order to fit into this situation. And which I think we all do to some extent, right? Which but it's a skill too. It is a total skill. I'm really good at like just, you know, like you, I'll make you like me and it'll well, you be didn't great. Feel right about and, it? The, the, no, and, well, because well, I think like for me, I, I didn't really know how to like l- literally learning how to like bring myself into interactions and, and, and kind of just bring me like always felt so scary. And I, and I don't know if a lot of that is, um, you know, just like growing up and, and feeling, I, I don't know. If, I mean, I'll just like say it right. Like I've, I'm openly gay. And so that has been, I think growing up, um, I, I lived a lot of my life feeling like there was something like wrong with me or that there was something like bad inside of me and, and feeling like I have to kind of, hide that piece of me i got really really good at just like morphing into whatever i needed to be even if that wasn't like who i was and so um that's been a big journey for me for sure um and then i just think being like really gentle with myself you know and like realizing that every day is 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 different and and i'm gonna feel a certain way every every day is gonna feel different and there's gonna be certain things going on internally and and that's like okay just like meeting myself where i'm at day in and day out and doing the things that i can do to like nurture myself through sleeping and through like yoga i do a lot of yoga is like a huge piece of my um kind of self-care um routine i do a lot of yoga and you know trying to like eat well and do all these things to kind of create like a good like healthy baseline for myself and then just so I can kind of show up and and live life the best that I know how. I have no idea if any of this is making sense, but I'm just talking. Well, no, you're talking. The, the, the words <laughs> matter just, maybe more than you I realize. Just, did I just keep talking? No. So a couple things. One, yoga. I've never done yoga. So yeah. you can you can invite me to one of your yoga sessions and I can try it once. If it, it actually yes. is, is useful to you because I've, I've heard about I've heard people find great value and I've just never done it. And I'm not lying to you. It is probably the most powerful thing that I do in my life. I, we, we do like a whole segment on yoga. It's it's been a beautiful, beautiful tool for me. I have nothing so but time. Come, so you can come anytime. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We, we can go there if you want to. Uh, we can. Uh, let's. But I, I want to bring this up, and the the hardcore fans of people I know show would maybe possibly remember this. And I've told some people in my life outside of the podcast, mm-hmm. and I wasn't going to bring it up until you brought it up. But you mm-hmm. you said that you're openly gay. Mm-hmm. Do you remember Brian the party that we were at? <laughs> When this information was released to me, you there's and I've, I it's episode four, I think John Haddon and I were just kind of talking about why I'm having this podcast. Yeah. And one of the reasons is that, well, I use race and religion and sexual orientation, that there are people in this world that because they are not in the majority in one of these categories, their lives are way more difficult than I think they should be. Absolutely. And I want people to understand that we're all the same. Yeah. And we're either we're the same or in the ways that we're different don't matter. We don't no one needs to have greater power than anybody else. At least that is my theory, and hopefully other people can sign up and agree with that. But I was at this party where there was three, and we won't talk, use any other names in specific because I don't I don't know where everybody else is with their public uh outness, but you and then two others in this a matter of minutes, you all came out to me <laughs> and it was, and I swear this is true, the most mind blowing experience of my life because I'm a small town Minnesota guy, mm-hmm. didn't know much about gay people, didn't yep. have experience with gay people, had this perception of gay people. And at the same time, I had three of my pretty good college friends, acquaintances that were gay and I didn't know it. And then all of a sudden you're all, you went from being straight to gay Mm -hmm. in my mind in this one moment of time. And maybe I had a few drinks in me and this was like, what the hell is going on here? I like all these people and they're gay. What do I do with this information? And what I did with it is over time, just like, Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just my misperception, my being wrong of what I'm supposed to think of someone that's gay. Mm. It that was the first moment of my life where it just like 
started to fall away. Yeah. And wow. and I don't know if you remember that so much because you you come out with everyone that you've yeah. come out to. Yeah. But it really blew my mind in the craziest way ever. Wow. I do remember that. It was at um, yeah, it was in Blaine. Yes. Me in Bl- yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. At her house party. Yes. No, I t- I totally remember that. And I do remember you being like, oh, my God. Like, I remember it kind of have it for sure having an impact on you. I don't know oh, yeah. that I realized that it had that big of an impact on you. Um, yeah, that was. I'm trying to think where I was at in my coming out process at that point, because the people that were not naming one of them was my ex-boyfriend. He was there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, because you said that and you said like you and him were together we to and, call then you, the... and then you kissed each other in front of me. Oh, and that I don't was like, remember that. And that was like the holy shit part of the process. <laughs> I do not remember us doing that. Oh, I'm pretty Must sure. Must have been like really in like the, a shock and awe. Like, <laughs> we're going to really drive it home to Kurt right now. Um, it's funny. We used to call it the trifecta. We used to say like because we would. If, so for people that are listening and they're like, what in the world are you guys talking about? A very close friend of mine from college. We both came out. I mean, this is a lot of, there's a whole story that we could go into there, but we, we essentially came out around the same time and we used to call it the trifecta because we would always sit people down and it was always, I'm gay. He's gay. And we're together. There was always like this, like, Oh my gosh. Like we used to just kind of drop that on people, which was always kind of funny. But like, I mean, I must say everybody was, incredible about that in college um yeah that was it is it is it is so like being gay right like my sexuality and then and coming out and all of that that felt like you know at the time that i came out so that was when i was like 22 i'm 33 now so this is like 11 years ago that i came out mm-hmm. essentially it feels now to me like the biggest like non-issue ever. Like I feel of like course. I, I feel like I have like so many other things in my life that feel way more like I don't know if con- I should, concerning is not probably the right word, but more things that I'm invested in working on, right, than my sexuality, which is a blessing. That I mean, how lucky am I that I get to live somewhere where they can kind of just become something that I don't really have to think about that much, and um, and I can just kind of live my life. Um, pretty openly but what, what i will what i will say that that coming out and saying that you're gay and then like learning how to live your truth are two very different things okay in my opinion this is just my experience i got really really good at saying to people i'm gay like i can do that pretty i mean it's not a super i think most people in my life like know that now it's actually very odd now when people will say like you have a girlfriend you know i'm like whoa <laughs> i we haven't like i haven't had to like do this in so long i forgot that that was a thing but I, I think that in my experience, it's been a huge journey for me on un, un, unpacking many years of me kind of feeling that shame about that piece of who I am. And and it's left a lot of pretty deep marks internally for me. And and learning how to just kind of openly be me is is a real journey. And I I'm I'm glad that hopefully maybe us coming out opened your eyes to that like it's just we're all humans you know i think that's like the biggest thing maybe you don't feel that way i don't know yeah no i i totally do it's just if, if you if it wasn't the three of you that night i don't know who it would have been i like, how yeah. that would have happened and it i'm just so happy it, it happened yeah. that way where yeah i was presented and this is it lines up with the many reasons i have this podcast but I and we do we do a I do a being wrong segment later because mm-hmm. this is this is what it's for and anyone that's listening gets to in their own way with with this episode or any episode of mine or anything that they ever take in that's other people like sharing information mm-hmm. sometimes you're going to be presented with information that contradicts what you think mm-hmm. they collide right in front of you and how are you going to react you can be like what I think is true and screw the world, screw everybody else. I know everything right now. Right. Or are you going to be like, damn it. This doesn't make sense anymore. I got to yeah. figure something out. Cut and that's it. how I approach everything. I think I know some things, but every time something comes at me, that's different. I need to like consider it like, Oh, yeah. again, did, did, I, gotta, did I, gotta, I have gotta, this gotta, wrong too. Yeah. And that's how I live my life. And it, I it, I think it's the way to live because I keep growing and learning and exposing myself to new situations. 
And I realize I don't know that much. I'm trying to know things and I maybe know a lot more than other people. But to me, I still don't know that much. Mm -hmm. And I take that approach. And I love when I receive contradictory information that's presented to me in a way that it's it's easy for me to receive it well. So when mm -hmm. three good friends yeah. explain to me or just don't you know, explain, well, you kiss and each then other. Kiss in front yeah, of you. I can't that, believe we did that. That's so funny. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, well, at that time, I don't know. It was yeah. weird. At that time, it was a lot. Damn. But it, it forces me to do something. And I that was one of the first steps in my life where I realized that I can be wrong about something sure. and I, I need to think about I need to do something else about this. Yeah. And I maybe because I had that experience with you guys at night that that yeah. that leads me down this path to do what I'm doing today and trying to oh. show people that you've got to you got to get to this point where things that you've held true your whole life they might be wrong and that's okay. Uh -huh. Why why should anyone expect themselves to know everything? endlessly throughout time why 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 do we have these egos that we have to be right about everything we don't have to be i'm sorry if you lived your first 70 years of your life thinking was something was true and then you find out it might not be true that's life learn to deal with it and embrace it and think i'm happy that i've learned it by now instead of never knowing this that, that's the way that i look at it that's amazing and and i think i think we can all take lessons from that that at the end of the day and this is, you know, in my opinion, we're all human beings doing the best that we know how on a day to day basis. And particularly right now, I mean, politically, right? Like we live in quite the time where there's a lot of differing opinions. And it's in it I, for me, it's it's hard when I come across people that maybe have differing views where you just want to like label that person as this and that and, and they fit into this box. And I think it takes actually I think it's it's the harder route to go to genuinely try to hear somebody out and to genuinely listen and not just try to like attack and try to like prove them wrong. I think that that's that's really where like if we're going to change as like human beings on this planet and 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 work through a lot of the stuff that's going on, it's going to be through that, right? It's like finding common ground and finding the humanity in each other. And I think it's I think if you're not willing to listen to people, I, th I think that that comes from a space of people just being scared of their own stuff getting triggered. Like, like if, if we're so set in these hard and fast rules of how we see the world, it doesn't mean that you have to like give those things up. But if you're not even like willing to like listen to other people, like I, I think I think we hold so many of those like very rigid forms of thinking to, to like protect ourselves internally and then to not have our own insecurities get messed with because there's, a, I think we all have spaces in, in inside of us where we don't want to go. Right. Cause it's scary as hell. And it's like, I don't like trying to do that work to really dive into some of this stuff and maybe change my way of thinking is going to be freaking hard. And I don't, and I, and it's easier for me to just like, you know, block everybody else out and say, you're wrong. I'm right. Because that's going to keep me more in, in alignment. I think so. I you think know? that is the reaction. I think that was probably the way I did things. In fact, I know when I was younger, I hated the possibility of ever being wrong about anything. Yeah. And I, as a kid, I would throw tantrums if there was ever someone ever tried to act like I was wrong about something. No, mm -hmm. it's no one wants to be wrong. But you'll realize once you start embracing being wrong. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, I used to think one thing and that's not true anymore. I don't think that anymore. Yes. It's, it's like the most exciting journey you can begin because you can start learning. You can unlearn everything you've learned, relearn it if it's right. Cool. Then you had that one right. Mm -hmm. But unlearn everything. And sometimes I realize, yeah, that's just what I the people that surrounded me at that point in my life where I learned this thing, I thought it was true. Mm -hmm. They didn't know enough to they didn't know any better, but they didn't sure. know enough to give me the best possible information that will ever exist throughout the 75, 80, 90, 100 years that I might live in my life. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, they didn't have the best information, but that's what I received. And but mm -hmm. it's not the best information anymore. The better information's out there. Let's go get it. Let's get it. Let's go live this journey of finding all this information that is available and will become available. Don't just stick with what you were once told years ago because that's what you were told. That doesn't make it true ever. And you're out there getting it right now. Yes. With this podcast. Yes. And I, I, this is maybe the best example having this conversation with you where I can yeah. really demonstrate why I do this. Awesome. And I hope that connects with people because if that doesn't connect with people, then I guess I'm doing it wrong. And yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to learn why I'm wrong about this. But I'm, this, is, this is it. This well, is it, Brian. Well, I'm so glad that we came out to you that day in whatever year that would have been. That was probably about 10, 10 or 11 years ago would be my guess. Okay. Yeah, it was probably around there. 
Yep. So I was 22. 2009, roughly 2008. The gayest party ever. It might have been. <laughs> <laughs> at least that you'd been at, right? Yes. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so that, that kind of got sidetracked off of one of the things you were seeing as yeah. a part of your personal growth journey, but maybe you can, that can, we can swing back into that with some other things that you yeah. had come to mind. If you have other things that were coming to mind. Where were we? So I, should we it, talk about the refresh network? Is that yeah, what we want to talk that, about? That's good. So yeah, this is the reason for the timing of this conversation today is earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, you had posted a video with your refresh network, which yeah. I guess I had like subscribed to a couple of years ago and then kind of forgotten about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's probably because you, you, you went away for a little Just bit. Just a sign that we're not posting enough. And right? that's, but you know what? Like, like I have this mission to release a podcast episode every Friday. Oh, you're but doing it every week. Every yeah, that's impressive. And it's a commitment to myself to like stay on task and do it. But it doesn't mean that every Friday, every episode is going to be as potentially valuable to the average listener as other Fridays. Mm-hmm. I think it might be a better approach to make sure when you're putting something out that is really meaningful and powerful. That's that's one school of thought. So if you took a break because mm-hmm. you knew you can do your best work in that time, fine. But if it sounds like you're you're much closer to being ready to go to start doing it again with a greater purpose. Yeah. So I. Several, a few years ago, I think it was like 2016, I kind of going back to what we were talking about before, I, I had kind of hit this point with, with some of my work where I was like, um, man, I, I need some like, I need to like inject some passion into what I'm doing. And I, and I, I was starting kind of this journey of, you know, whatever you want to call it, personal development. And, and I'd kind of been through some stuff that really made me start to go like, Hmm. Like, who am I? Like, how do I want to, how do I want to live in this world? And I was meeting all these like really awesome, incredible people. Cause I think there's, I really do. I have to be careful sometimes about going too down this train of thought, but I, I do think that sometimes, right. Like, like life kind of brings these people into your life at, at certain moments when you're like, wow, I really like, I'm kind of putting this out, this vibe, or I'm putting kind of moving in this direction. And then all of a sudden I'm meeting all these really incredible people that are kind of on similar journeys. Yeah. And, and I felt like that was happening a lot in my life. Okay. And, and I was, and I was, and I was like, I, I'm, I'm having these great conversations with people and we're, we're talking about these really powerful things, you know, similar to probably like what you're doing with people on your podcast, but we weren't recording it. And I was like, I want to, I want to start putting together something that's all about like, uplifting and like positive and like life lessons like what have people been through and what have they learned throughout that process and how how can we like bring that a little bit more to the masses and so i started this thing called the refresh network with a good friend of mine bruce myers who has his own um his own video production company here in town the uh, waiting room collective and it just like he just moved back from he was living out in california and we i was like we had a conversation at my lake cabin hey i'm I'm kind of looking to do some of this kind of work. And he was like, Hey, let's like partner and see what we can do. And so we started, we, we put out 13 episodes in that, I think it was 13 episodes in that first kind of round of it where I would just go around and interview people. And it was awesome. But for me, it was, I think kind of, you know, you talked about like finding your voice in a different way. It was me really finding my voice in a different way away from being on the set of a news station. You know, I mean, I was still doing that and still doing, doing um, the work at Carol Evan. Uh, but this kind of just allowed me to explore a little bit of a different side of myself um, creatively. And then it, it went away. We kind of got busy. We were, we were trying to put it out every week and trying to put out a video every single week just got to be a lot when we both have full-time jobs. And it just realistically was getting kind of tough. And so we we took kind of a hiatus. And then I have since been on this real journey for myself, kind of my own like mental health journey, realizing some stuff that I've struggled with. And I have felt very, very strongly that that we need to be talking about this stuff more and that some of this stuff needs to be out there because um, there's a lot of people out there doing that kind of work that have been so influential for me in my own life and like my own journey. And so we decided to relaunch the refresh network. We just did it a couple weeks ago where we put the video out um, where I kind of opened up about some of my own struggles, but our, my vision for what we want to do with the refresh is to go around and just have real conversations with people that have struggled with their mental health. And, and, and right, that looks like so many different things for people because there's, you know, there's anxiety. There's a lot of people struggling with depression out there. There's, um, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's things all across the map. Right, and you that, mentioned in the video that you yep, dissed all three with, of those you've yep. struggled with yourself. Yes. Which I would not have ever noticed. Yeah. I mean, I've not, not been close to in recent years, right. but there's no evidence to me. Yep. Which it's probably meaning you and a lot of other people. Yep. 
same thing. And I don't know so much, some of that with me a little bit, but I, I think other people might have it a lot worse than me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to learn about it and try to, yeah. try to be an ally in some way. Well, that's amazing. And I think, right, the fact that nobody would ever know, I think is kind of what's scary about some of this stuff is that we get so good at, you know, projecting to the world this image of ourselves that's pulled together and perfect and da -da, I mean, not saying that I'm perfect, but just, you know, you, you, you get really good at like pulling yourself together when the internal experience isn't exactly that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just feel so strongly that there's, and we're seeing it a lot in the headlines, right? Like people that are taking their own lives. I mean, there's so much of that and it, and it just breaks my heart every time I see it because I think a lot of that is um, there's so much shame around this stuff and people feeling like they're awful human beings because of some of this stuff that they're struggling with. And um, we need to be talking about it more because um, I know for me, I um, anxiety. So I've always, I've always really felt like I struggled with anxiety. That's always been a word that kind of was like, I mean, I can look back to my childhood and, and um, I always kind of had a lot of like anxious tendencies and, you know, things like that as I've learned more about my own story as a kid that were like, wow, I was really kind of, um, I had some of that stuff going at a young age before I even really had an understanding. And then I went through some stuff in middle school and kind of into college and where I, I, um, I always kind of identified that, yeah, I struggle with anxiety and it kind of ebbed and flowed. And then, um, my struggles with obsessive compulsive disorder are things that have kind of come more into kind of a clearer lens for me as of late. I didn't really realize how much some of that stuff was, was going on for me. Um, and which is very common because it's a very misunderstood disorder. It's a lot of people when they hear of obsessive compulsive disorder, they think of hand washing and they think of being, you know, I'm just, oh, I'm, oh, I'm so OCD because I like to keep my room tidy and things like that. And, yeah. and, and, and when I talk about this, I always like to be very clear that that is a real struggle for a lot of people. Like I'm, I'm not diminishing that at all. I know people where that's like, I mean, that consumes hours of their day washing their hands and you know, that's a very real thing for a lot of people. There's also other ways that it shows up and, and there's kind of a, m a much more kind of invisible way that, that OCD can, can manifest in people's lives. And there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on for me, um, that was coming out in, in, in some ways that, that I just was like, you know, I need to kind of understand this more and, and learn more. A lot of it had to do with me kind of getting into a relationship with people, like trying to be in a relationship that did not go well. <laughs> and so um, that was kind of a big trigger for me, um, I think, in, in realizing, hey, I really want to kind of get a better understanding of, of this stuff. And so with the refresh, I'm hoping to to bring some of those conversations to light just simply to let other people know that it's okay to struggle and, and, and that, that's, that it, it says nothing about your character and who you are. This is just sometimes, um, this is just part of being a human, right? Struggle is part of it. Something that... I know I've been voicing to a few people, probably not in any podcast yet, is I've learned we are not inherently good at anything. Mm. So like if you're mentioning getting in relationships, not going mm. well, like there, I think there is some sort of expectation that as human beings, we should be good at relationships without ever having experience in relationships. Like how in the world are we going to be good at anything we've never done before? Mm. There's things are going to eventually come up that make us realize, Ooh, I'm not, I, I, yeah. I don't know what to do about this or what I'm doing isn't working. And, and the problem I think is the other person in the relationship, not allowing for understanding that, that each, as each individual is not going to be that great at everything. Like, except like we're, if we're going to do this, let's do this together. We're going to suck at a whole bunch of stuff and yeah. let's just be able to communicate about it. And let's be open about it and honest about it. Let's express our feelings as best we can. And let's all, to do this together. And then we can grow together, learning that, yeah, we, we all suck at a lot of things, but we'll begin to suck a little bit less at things as we just yes. talk about it. But if we have either this feeling that the other person's expecting us to be great at everything, or probably more so, we're expecting ourselves to be great at everything, it's like automatic failure. And I'm pretty sure everyone experiences that because we've all had our first and second and third relationship. Some people end up like in a marriage out of their first relationship and maybe they do grow together and it works fine. Or maybe in some cases they're, they're just, they never get better at it, but they stay together for whatever reason they decide to stay together. I don't know. But 
we're not going to be good at anything right away. Never. Have you ever done that's anything so for the true. first time and been just like the best person in the world at it? No. Well, I, well I'm perfect. So, oh, well, so it's, right. it's, it's always come very easy I for forgot, me. Right, yeah, right. yeah. We just haven't gotten to that part. Okay. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, my gosh. It's so true. You got to practice. And, and no, I, I mean, I think it's, and that's so true, right. With, with like relationships. Cause I can even say in my own life right now, I'm, I think I'm, I'm very hesitant, hesitant to step into it because I'm scared of the experience. Um, when the reality is the only way that you're going to get good at being in a relationship is to be in a relationship. Right. Um, and, and that's, I think that's something that, uh, that I've tried to be better at, at implementing whether it's relationships or whether it is anything, right? And like the word relationship, do... we, we often think romantic relationship, but every yeah. time like you and I have a relationship, it's one that we haven't connected with in many years. And I think having this conversation today probably brings us a lot closer together and maybe we'll actually hang out in real life Imagine at some that. point yes. again, because we've had a conversation. Yes, it's being recorded, but we're talking about real things that <laughs> yes. matter. And then you connect with people because you talk about real things and then you want to like, interact with that person more or if it's possible because yeah. you realize that they share some of these things in their mind that that you are also running around your mind sometimes yeah and that's whether it's in a romantic relationship or friendship or business connecting with people getting better at connecting with people will just improve your life because you're gonna have more better people in your life that understand you and you're gonna start to understand yourself better that's what i find and i want to share that with people that that's possible Whatever you're not that good at right now, it's because you haven't done it that much. Totally. Or maybe you're just not that naturally gifted with that, but you can get better. You just got to practice. Yep. Yep. And sit, But sitting around and thinking about all these things you're not good at and not doing anything, unfortunately, it doesn't work. And I've learned that. And I you know, jump in and, yeah. and, and be not that good at some things with risk of embarrassment or failure. But you'll, you'll climb out of that slightly better at it than you were before. And you'll keep getting better the more you do whatever it is that you know that you really think you need to do. And it's so hard to be in that space of knowing what you want to be doing or what you, I kind of hate the word need, but like where you want to go with your life, but not taking action towards it and just sitting around and like sulking in it. It's one of the most, it's torture mm -hmm. in my I, opinion. I think, I imagine most people do it. Some people probably yeah. have more torturous moments with that yeah. than others but I, I certainly that's that's what led to something like this like yes. having a podcast like I, I gotta do something I gotta try something yes. to, to prove that everything I've, I've learned so far is is worth something and then build from the next step yeah because you have that feeling of so I have a couple of things to say about that you have that feeling right that like gosh I'm like I want like this could be a really good thing or I'm I'm, I'm meant to be doing this or like you know, like I, this could be such a great thing, but I'm not like allowing myself to like step into that because it's scary, right? It's, it's scary. like, it's scary. And like, that's on the other side, like what we want generally, I feel like in life, there's always going to be fear between that thing and us. And it becomes a daily practice of learning how to just get really, really good at being uncomfortable and, and like learning how to, I would say that that's when you talk about things that I'm trying to kind of live in my own life that's a that's a pretty fundamental one right now is just being get comfortable with being uncomfortable yes because all the things that we want in life are generally going to require us to be immensely uncomfortable getting there because it's stretching us outside of our comfort zone and and if we're not good at like managing that feeling um it's gonna it's gonna we're gonna feel pretty stuck um and then the other thing that i would gosh what was i i'm forgetting it again what did, what did you say? You said something that like totally triggered this another, this is two really deep thoughts that I was going to share with everybody and now it's gone. It's just, now it's I know that you, you have a mind filled with deep thoughts that are just somehow buried. Like what, what's weighing down your deep thoughts? So right. Much, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's like get into that now. I can't remember what I was going to say, but, but I, I, I do think that that's, that's an important thing to bring up that um, I think we a lot of times have this idea that life is supposed to be, comfortable and that it's supposed to like feel good all the time and and that's I, i've realized that that doesn't at least for me that's not the case because everything that everything that has felt rewarding to me whether it's at a really basic level whether i i struggle with a lot of like social anxiety um showing up to a birthday party with people that i don't really know because i want to be there and support a friend feels incredibly terrifying for me sometimes because i'm like oh my gosh this is like really getting me outside of my comfort zone but i generally leave that party feeling like oh that was like i'm glad i did that and i and, and I, I was there for my friend and i connected with some people and that felt good 
but um, I had to go through an uncomfortable experience to get there. So that's like a really minute example. Is it ever rewarding to do something you already know what you know how to do and you're already comfortable with? Or is it only rewarding when you've done something that you feels like an accomplishment? Say that again. What do you mean? It, 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 I'm, I guess I'm, I'm agreeing with your point. Is yeah. it ever rewarding to do something that you already know how to do and you're already mm. good at? Is that ever rewarding mm. or is it rewarding to to overcome something, to go past some barrier that was in place in your mind or in reality mm -hmm. and come out on the other side and think, ooh, I did that and yes. I feel like I can do that now yes. or I'm better at it now than I was before. That's the rewarding feeling. Doing yes. the things that we've always done or the things that we've done once and then continue to do the same thing, I don't think is that rewarding. Because it's like second nature, right? It's yes. not it's something that we've already established that we're able to do. We already know how to do that. Yeah. That's why it's not rewarding. Let's do something different. That's a good point. Absolutely. Because it's it opens it's it's just so much more expansive, right? To step into the thing that feels scary, because that's gonna open up, open you up to a whole new oh, yeah. part of yourself that you didn't that not maybe not that you didn't realize was there. Sometimes but maybe you knew it was there, but you were just like didn't know how to get there. And and there's nothing more rewarding than that. I don't think than than that personal space that it creates by getting outside of our comfort zones. It's what we tell ourselves that we think whatever means the conversation we have in our own heads plus when we project what other people are going to think of us and that was i know for me and i i always go back to small town minnesota and maybe that maybe this is small town everywhere maybe you grew up in fargo right uh yeah most of my chat yep that and what also colorado yeah, I, was, I was born in colorado and then moved to fargo so maybe maybe in those places as well it's the idea that what other people think it matters a lot to some people in some cultures and i think my upbringing is one of them, whereas, uh, but I do know people that really don't care what anyone thinks at all, which is kind of awesome and also kind of scary because they do some things that yeah. I question at times. But then again, <laughs> why should they don't care what I think? So why should it, I even think about it at all? But it's it's overcoming that because I'm sure some of the shame that you feel involving whatever is because other people put ideas in your head of what you're supposed to be. And then yeah. when you realize I'm not what they think I'm supposed to be, and that's shameful. Yes. Yes. And trying to live your life for the approval of other people is not going to lead to a very happy place. So, I mean, there's there's some of that to an extent, and that's just part of being human, right? It feels good to get validation and it feels good to, um, to, to kind of get a tip of the cap from people and, and that, that stuff feels good and there's no shame in that. But um, I think if that's, I think I had gotten to a point where that, that was maybe a little, that was driving my choices maybe a little bit too much than than what and, and and i wasn't making decisions for me right like I, because because of i was scared of how am i going to be perceived by other people and, totally and you know like for me like stepping out and doing some of this refresh network stuff i'm constantly paranoid that i'm going to sound like too like woo woo and like too sensitive and like too uh, out there and and you know what i've really it's been a huge exercise for me to just put it out there mm -hmm. and say like like, cause like, what's the alternative? I think, I think maybe, I think I've probably hit this point where the fear of what other people are going to think is less scary than what it's going to be like if I don't start taking action yes. towards these things yep. that I want to be doing, because that's doing more harm to me at this point than if everybody in my life all, all of a sudden said, you're ridiculous. Like, why are you putting that stuff out there? This goes into a previous conversation I had on this podcast that involves free will or what I think is the illusion of free will. But putting that aside, because that's that's too deep of a topic, but it's mm -hmm. it's what we we only do something when we're more compelled to do it than all of the resistance that we feel against it. Yes. And I think a lot of times uh, what people think involves a ton of resistance that stops us from doing something. But then at a certain point, maybe it's this mid 30s age that that we are in that we feel that it's like I, I can't care what they think anymore this is what i feel i have to do and at some point you reach the tipping point where you start to do the things that previously you were too concerned of what other people thought about you and you didn't do because i've literally at times because i've yeah because i've gotten into a space right where i'm so like internally conflicted and really not in a good place because i've been i've been like ignoring that for far too long there's always this like quote that Oprah, I love Oprah. How do you feel about Oprah? 
Well, Sorry, I haven't I'm watched really, her really in, in the recent spot. years, but I, I've had yeah, she's cool. I, I, I haven't. I guess I don't have a huge opinion on her. I know big, that a lot of people love her, and she yeah. seems to have done a lot of good things. Yeah, she always. Um, so she does i mean she's got great stuff out there with like super soul sunday she does like pretty deep conversations with people she has a good podcast around that but she is uh, saying that she has always said that i think has always like stuck with me is that you have to pay attention to the whispers of your soul and that like that like things in our life kind of start off as like these little like whispers of like hey like maybe we should do that like maybe i'm like interested in that and then, like, if we don't, like, listen to those things, it seems like they kind of just get, like, louder and, like, louder and louder and louder before, like, you know what, you're, like, run into a brick wall because you haven't been, like, listening to this direction that you want to go with your life. And that's something that I think has a lot of truth to it. I think I've, I have to also be very careful with myself to not feel like there's, like, these hard and fast rules that, like, I have, if I'm not listening to the whispers of my soul, then like, I'm not going to be happy. And like, I can like actually put a lot of like pressure on myself around that stuff. So I always try to take those things with with a grain of salt. But I do think that there's a lot of truth to um, when we feel so compelled to do something, whether that's like work that we feel like we want to be creating in the world or just like things that we really want to do with our life. If we don't listen to them and we don't listen to them and we don't listen to them, it feels like it just gets more intense and more intense until, like you said, you hit a point where you're like, wow, this is really, like, not good, and I need to, like, do the thing, or else this is not going to be very, this is not going to end well. The shift for me, and I talked about in episode two of the podcast with my brother, and then episode 26 with my niece, it involves going to Michael Burnoff's core strength experience, where mm -hmm. where some of these feelings and thoughts built up so much that, like, that was the, the real push for me to yeah. eventually do this podcast, and I, I don't, I think I need it, something like that. Other people might be able to just start base without it. Otherwise, if you think you need a little push, then, then listen to those episodes and, and learn a little bit more about that from those conversations. And now I, I had a thought that escaped me. Now it came back. So okay, my thought look came at back to me. You, you mine, saw, is, you, mine are like, there's two of them floating in the air somewhere that I'm waiting. And there here's to. the thoughts. You, you mentioned these whispers of your soul. Yeah. And that's the way Oprah presents it. And I, that's cool. I, I just think thoughts they're just their thoughts some thoughts will strike me for the first time and they'll be kind of crazy mm -hmm. and then i'll think oh that's gonna happen isn't it now i'm at the point where i don't i don't like dismiss thoughts or think i can't do this mm. when a thought hits me now at this point in my life it's like oh that's kind of a crazy idea but it's probably gonna happen because i just mm. thought of it and that thought's not gonna go away so i better just do it and mm. and move on from it rather than letting this thought hit me and then dismiss it for whatever reasons i used to dismiss things where the, the thoughts that keep on hitting you the things that you keep on thinking about yes. and then don't acting on those those will weigh anybody down those mm. used to weigh me down now it's just go for it just go for it, and at the end, it'd be like, eh, I guess that didn't work as well as I'd hoped, yeah. but at least it's, I've cleared that thought from my mind, it's and now bad, new yeah, thoughts can bad. emerge. But if you allow the same thoughts to just sit in your mind and come back to you constantly, and you're not doing anything about it, I've learned from experience that I used to do that. I did that wrong, and if you're if I'm talking to you, Brian, mm -hmm. and anyone listening, if you're allowing that to happen, I think you're doing it wrong. Maybe it's not easy to find a different way to do it. I understand. I struggled with that for a while. Mm -hmm. If the same thoughts are weighing on you, you got to find a way to move past them. There's so many more cool, new, exciting things that'll hit your mind when you clear out the whatever percentage of your thoughts are going to the same types of things all the time. You're not doing anything about. Mm. And isn't it cool how like the similar concept, like like just has different wording for everybody. Like it kind of goes back to this whole idea that like we're all kind of like we're all human, right? And we all, we all, we all have different ways of things resonating for us. Yes. And like the, the way that you describe it resonates for you. And, and you know, Oprah says it one way and somebody else is going to sure. say it totally different. And, it, and I think that's the beauty of it is that it's just finding ways that, that resonate for us. And that's, that's like, that's your way, you know? Um, and, and also I think that's, it's so true. It's almost like you be, you become, you've, you've been a little quicker to like, recognize that when something's hitting you that you really want to do like let's just do it right like instead of is, is it that like maybe you can see you can see where this is this road's gonna go if i just like pretend like it's not there and like and 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 not 
actively pursue that thing that I'm thinking about. Well, I would also episode nine of the podcast. You're so my, good with numbers, by the way. Well, maybe because I've you know I spent some time on this <laughs> with my it. friend Josh. We talked about free will or the illusion of free will, and he at that time he didn't he didn't agree with me on this, and that's fine. Mm. I, I learned my my understanding from Sam Harris. Uh, is a author and podcaster and philosopher and mm-hmm. a bunch of things. He, I've never, I learned, I don't create my own thoughts. Mm. Like I, I don't, I'm not the author of my thoughts. The thoughts hit me based on whatever is around me, mm-hmm. whatever I'm experiencing in that moment, who I'm with, what they're saying, something will strike me. It, but it's always striking me. I'm never like going and grabbing a thought. So when you you had these good thoughts that hit your mind and then suddenly they disappeared and you were like, they're right there. I can't get mm-hmm. you because you're not you're never going to be able to go get a thought. It's going to have to come back to you, Brian. So just yeah. wait. It'll come back to you. Okay. If, they're, if they're good enough thoughts, they'll come back I'm gonna to you. I'm going to sit here all night until they return. Because you, you, you will never create it. Again. You can't recreate it. It will just come back to you when the moment's right because you've had that thought already. It'll, it'll it, Something else will strike something I say now or something someone else says yeah. tomorrow or some other day will bring that thought back to you and then you'll 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 probably tie it all together mm. but now when a thought hits me i realize it's yeah it's this thoughts it's probably coming back again mm. so instead of just it's a i maybe can't deal with it right now unless it's urgent like sometimes okay here's here's a story from my life kind of recently and i was shopping at aldi mm-hmm. and i i came across this lady that i i found to be appealing and the thought struck me that i've got to i've got to do something about it mm-hmm and uh, to make just a really short part of the story at this moment, I did something about it because I realized I, the thought's going to hit me. It's going to keep hitting me. I better just do it. Do it and be done with it. And whatever yep. happens, happens. But to have that thought hit me and then not do anything about it, that's something that used to weigh on me. Like yeah. I would meet someone and then not like ask them for like, you know, not give them my number or whatever I wish I would have done. And then it would just ruin my day. Like, oh, why can't I have the confidence to do this yeah. thing? Now I've gotten to the point where I just, I do it. I do it and let it go and whatever. I love that. But that's, that's a learning curve. It's something I, it's a hurdle I needed to get over. It wasn't an easy hurdle, but it's a, it's a hurdle people can get over because I've I've done it. And that's because it it forces you outside of a lot of times. I feel like those things are like, it's going against the grain of how we've operated for a really long time in our lives. Yeah, because it's like well, triggering stuff that like we don't want to feel triggered, and but you, but yeah, you eventually like realize, wow, if I want to like live this life that I feel like I'm capable of or that I want to live, I gotta like get real good at just sitting with that crap when it comes up and and, and stepping into it, you know, because again, everything that we want is kind the of the version of that. me that you used to know wouldn't have done that probably at all or ever, yeah. and then years later, did you say hi to her? Oh yeah, no. Wait, she, she she actually I gave her my podcast business card and, yes. and she got back to me. We, we went out once and okay. And at this point in time, I'm not sure what's going on. But yep, there's a whole yeah, other. No, it, it actually but look at that. I'll That's probably cool. have her on the podcast someday if she's going. She's very interesting. Oh my god, I love that. And yeah, so it's and and, and all of that. Maybe it's just another really cool person that you have in your life. Like yes. none of none of that would have happened if you hadn't taken that initiative and and stepped outside. Of Recognizing the thoughts that strike me that strongly I better do something with because mm. otherwise it's going to bother me if I don't. Yes. It's a huge shift. Mm-hmm. Well done, my friend. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's me adding some personal growth into your I personal love that. segment. No, that's awesome. Is, is there more personal growth stuff that you've got or? Oh my God. Otherwise, I uh, go on. here's we, what, here's, go what, as as here's what I will add. Here's what I will add about the, talking about like the thoughts and things like that kind of brought up an interesting point for me that, um, I really only share this because I, 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 I want, I feel very passionate about talking about obsessive compulsive disorder and, and, and a lot of that stuff is, is thought based is, um, kind of at the, at the roots of, of, of what OCD is, um, for a lot of people are, is like this really over sensitivity, like over like hyper vigilance to like what thoughts we're having and like what internal experiences we might be having and like a real, like placing an ins- intense amount of meaning to the thoughts that we're having. So this can manifest for people as, um, you know, Hey, I had like, like somebody that has generally that doesn't really struggle with OCD and then versus somebody that does struggle with it. Somebody like we all have weird thoughts, right? Like we all have thoughts that like pop up into our mind and are like, Whoa, that was kind of a weird thought. Like, I don't really want to be thinking that right now, but like generally 
somebody without OCD will kind of like have the heebie jeebies for a couple minutes or like a couple seconds and then kind of like move on with your mm-hmm. day. Somebody generally that struggles with OCD and where OCD kind of becomes a thing and kind of becomes a disorder is like that that thought kind of comes into your mind. And then instead of just letting that thing flow out and then kind of move on with your day, that thought gets really wrapped up in your mind. Oh, it gets very like, I need to examine this from every possible angle. And I, why, what does this mean about me or what does this say about me that I'm having this thought? Um, and this is a part of OCD that I don't think enough of us are talking about. And and the only reason I bring it up is because I, I just feel very passionate that like people out there need to know about this stuff if they're struggling with it, because it, because it, it can go down this road of a lot of shame, like a lot of shame, because generally the thoughts that get hooked are things that like are like taboo or are like, were things that we're not supposed to be, be thinking. I'll, I'll give you a, an example. Um, one of the earliest times in my life that I that I had this kind of come up for me or that I can kind of viv- vividly remember um, when it, we, they're called like intrusive thoughts in the OCD world is we had just moved to um, Fargo when I was in middle school um, and r- right before middle school. And I remember we were at my new house in Fargo and we were in the kitchen and my, my mom was in there and there were like there were like knives or something like that on the kitchen counter. And I had the thought randomly creeped into my mind. What if I grab that knife and I like stab my mom? Like that, just like a random weird thought. We all have them. It's part of being a human being. Like Mm -hmm. it doesn't say anything about who you are as a human being. Like we all think weird things on a day-to-day basis. That just is the reality. For me, I remember that hit me as like, oh my gosh, like what does this say about me that I had this weird thought that like I would do, like, does this mean that I want to do that? Does this mean that I'm a bad person? Does this da 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 da? And it kind of started this whole like storyline in my mind, right? Um, and and those kinds of things have been have really come up repeatedly for me in my life. And and I, I mean, they've themes of the thoughts have changed, and and a lot of that stuff I'm not like fully ready to just like dive into and talk about. But I really feel so strongly about putting that out there because. Somebody that doesn't understand that that's just kind of like this maybe weird thing that your mind does in the form of like OCD or some sort of anxiety disorder can really get sucked into this road of questioning who you are at the core. And then that's what breaks my heart about it is that, um, you know, before I really had a good understanding of a lot of this stuff, there was a lot of like, and I still struggle with it today, like um, really kind of going at like, who, who am I? And I must be this really bad person and things like that. So um Part of the work that I really want to dive into now is is raising a little bit of awareness around this. It's a hard thing to talk about. You raise like, it for me. I guess because like not it yeah well yeah because a lot of people just think of it like OCD is like being tidy right and that like and that, that that that's what it's about. Whereas again, washing your hands, tidy, all that stuff that it's kind of stereotypically known as or that it's commonly known as is a very real struggle for a lot of people. But there's also this. Um, I mean, if we're going to get technical, there's a side of of OCD that's called pure OCD where a lot of the, the mental like compulsions um, are, are all like kind of mental and they're not as visual in the form of like washing your hands or things like that, that people are doing to minimize anxiety. Um, there can be kind of just this real um, kind of examining and questioning and trying to figure out what these thoughts mean about who we are. All of that stuff um, is also a form of OCD. So I'm just throwing it out there because um, that, that, that is a piece of the work that I really want to dive into. And, um, I just feel like we need to be talking about it so that other people don't feel as much shame if that's what they're going through. So it appears that based on your description of that and my emphasis on other ways that thoughts strike us and how we're supposed to do it, that the thoughts that do hit us mm-hmm. and what we do with it, like how we react to those thoughts really drives our life to where it is. And, yeah. where, and, and if, yeah. if where your life is, isn't where you feel like you want it to be. It just means you need to come up with a better method of dealing with those thoughts. And I have no idea what the, if someone has OCD mm-hmm. and these types of thoughts are like terrorizing their mind. They can't get rid of them. I have no idea what to do. Right. But it's clearly not helpful to have those thoughts. So finding what, whatever 100%. method that might exist to yep. be able to dis- dismiss those thoughts like like you probably would want to, yeah. then that's a, you got to figure out how to 100%. do it. And maybe there's no way of doing it. I have no idea. No, and there's, I mean, there, there's incredible, there's, um, I mean, there's treatment out there. There's um, exposure response prevention is kind of a form of like cognitive behavioral therapy that um, that is kind of, they call it the gold standard for OCD where you really, you, you, it's all about like leaning into uncertainty really at the core of like without getting too OCD, like technical on stuff. Um, really at the core of it is just leaning into uncertainty because like I, 
OCD tends to really revolve on this or kind of thrives on this need for 100% certainty about things. So like in the case that I shared with you, I need 100% certainty that I would never do that to somebody that I would never stab my mom with that knife. And sorry to be like so graphic with that, but I mean, it's, I mean, it's the reality of, of usually what's what people are struggling with, things like that. But like I need 100% certainty that that would never happen. And we become fixated on needing that 100% certainty. Whereas, um, the work is, is really leaning into uncertainty because th that's going to be a never ending cycle for people that struggle with OCD, trying to get 100% certainty that I'm not, that, that, that this thought, um, doesn't say something bad about who I am. It's really leaning into like, maybe I am this awful person. Like maybe I'm not, but what I'm going to do is like learn to like get really good at sitting with the uncertainty and I'm going to live my life based on like, we usually go back to talking about like values. Like I'm going to, I'm going to live my life how I want to live it regardless of what's going on for me internally. Um, and I'm going to just really embrace uncertainty, which is a really hard thing to do, but that's been, um, so again, when I've kind of talked about a lot of the uncertainty stuff, that's really kind of where it's come from for me is just, um, my own work to, to kind of step into that space. It sounds like important work that yeah. I can't directly relate to, but I'd imagine there are a lot of people that can and are, yeah. are wanting to find a better way than they've, they've had so far. And I, I'd yeah. imagine you'll, you'll be able to make an impact. I want to, I want, you know, I want, and I think what's hard about it is again, it's just, it's a hard, um, a lot of the things that people get, things that get stuck in your mind usually are not very pretty rosy things, right? They're things that are pretty like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be thinking that. And that's why they get stuck. Um, and so we just need more people out there that are talking about it a little bit so that people can recognize that if that's going on for them. So then uh, to kind of recap that, there's I, I find that there are things that will get stuck in your mind is things that you wished hadn't been or you wish you could do but aren't doing and they keep mm. on recurring. And then you are talking about things, the weird thoughts that make you question who you are Yes, that sit in there. Mm -hmm. Those are totally different types of thoughts, I think, but both are debilitating in, in ways that yeah. if you don't realize that either some people, maybe some people don't have those same type of thoughts. Fortunately, like I don't think I deal with what you are dealing mm -hmm. with and you're describing. Mm -hmm. Well, well, no, I have weird thoughts that hit me sometimes yeah. and I just like, yeah, no, that's not me, whatever. Yeah. And I, I think, oh, I, I think I just come to accept that I'll have weird thoughts sometimes and it's okay. 100%. And it's not because again, I'm not the creator of my thoughts, different things I'm sensing around me. If you're a visual person and you see knives and you, and your brain goes through the Rolodex of all the possible things you might do with a knife. And then you see your mom over there and those thoughts connect. Mm -hmm. You didn't create that thought. It's just two things that you were seeing and somehow mm -hmm. your brain decides that that's a thought. Well, I'm not going to do that. So fine. Get away thought yes. and move on. And that's yes. how I feel like my brain handles it. But if someone else thinks I'm the worst person ever, cause I had that thought, I understand why that could happen. Yep. It's just the way that you approach it. And hopefully there's a solution for yeah. everybody. And, that, and I think you just illustrated beautifully the difference between somebody that tends to struggle with and tends not to, right? Mm -hmm. so it sounds like you have a pretty good ability to kind of dismiss those things when they creep into your mind. Very whereas, good ability. Whereas, yeah, whereas like the disorder comes in when, you know, people with OCD, we're not good at that. That's not a skill that we possess. So I, I think if someone's struggling with that, I, the, my one suggestion is learn, learn about how you get your thoughts and then mm. that you're not the author, that crazy, mm. awful thought that you had, you, Brian Pyatt didn't create it. Know your brain and whatever weird things going on around you just pushed it in front of you. And it's just mm -hmm. like a bad script probably in, in Hollywood, it's such an awful one that it would just get thrown away and never use. But yet, yeah. maybe your brain sees the script and think, maybe I have to do something with it because it exists. No, no, you yep. don't. You don't have to do anything yep. with it. It's Throw gone. Away. Garbage. Throw it away. Our minds are a uh, quite the machine, aren't they? They are. Yeah, and they're. I think they think some of the most beautiful work in life is learning how to have a good relationship with our minds because they can they can work in such incredibly magical, wonderful ways, and they can help us create all these awesome things that we want to do. And I think they can also be our biggest detriment is yoga also involving meditation in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. meditation involves releasing thoughts, correct? Yeah. Well, well, so meditation, big misconception about meditation is that meditation is about trying to get thoughts to go away, which is not at all the case. Okay. Meditation is more learning how to observe our thoughts and realize that our thoughts are separate from who we are as human beings. So kind of what you were talking about a little bit. It's, it's learning to sit down and just kind of get to a place of, of observing them and kind of, I mean, there's a lot of visuals out there, like just kind of looking at them as clouds, right? And kind of like allowing them to pass by without latching on 
and and trying to over examine and, and kind of take ownership for it's just getting into more of a space of allowing yourself to observe them, not, not make them go away. Cause that's not physically possible. Our mind is always going to be generating something up there. And yoga is, is really essentially a moving meditation in and of itself. For me, it's this like amazing practice of, or tool of kind of getting more into my body and like less into like my head space, which I feel like allows me to connect to, like who I am at the core and not like what my mind is trying to tell me that I am. Cause I think we live so much up in that head space. And it, for me, it's a beautiful tool of kind of getting more into like, you know, like the heart space and like the kind of the core of, of who I am. I would, I'm, I'm anxious to try it with you and we should do a class. Okay. I'm in. And then you can report back on your podcast. How it was. Yeah, definitely can do that. Okay. It's now time for the Being Wrong segment. Kurt Carstensen here with Brian Pyatt. Hello. But Brian, this is the Being Wrong segment. Okay. Is there something from your life that you can now confidently say, yeah. that, yep, I was wrong about that? I could probably say a lot of things for this. I think when I thought about this, it's more this notion that being pulled together and trying to be that person that's like doing everything right or that like looks cool or like looks, you know, good on the outside that that somehow is going to equal like a happy, fulfilling life. I realize now that it's actually our vulnerabilities and being real and like being open about struggle and the things that we're actually going through on a day-to-day -day basis and not just kind of putting our highlight reel out there that that's actually, I've found what nurtures the, the best closest relationships in my life and the most meaningful things. I think I, I tried for a really long time to just kind of always be like, and I, you know, I'm still guilty of it for sure. of just trying to kind of win people over and be the, the person that looks good from the outside and being really consumed with other, with what other people think, but trying to lean more in that direction of being real and being honest and, and, and being vulnerable, which is not an easy thing to do. It's not, it's very hard actually, yeah. but I think it's well worth it. Cause I think we are taught to to win people over, you got to be a certain way. And I'm finding that if I'm winning anybody over at this point in my life, it's because I'm being me 100% genuine mm -hmm. and not trying to win anyone over. I'm just here I am. Yep. I think I have some decent qualities. I'm sure I'm not perfect in every way, but I'm just going to be myself and the right people will be attracted by whatever it is that I am. Mm -hmm. And I'll just keep moving forward, attracting the right people to my life, as opposed to trying to attract a certain type of person by yes. being a certain way. Yes. And being, I mean, I just think realness and like authenticity and whatever that is for you, it's different for everybody. Like that's what, that's what resonates. You know, I, I keep saying it. We, we've talked a lot about it on the podcast of just kind of coming back to this notion of, we're all like human beings doing the best that we can day in and day out. And then sometimes that looks pretty messy. In fact, most times for me, at least that looks pretty messy. And instead of trying to like hide that and try to pretend like that's not what's going on for me, I'm finding that leaning into and embracing the struggle is, is pretty damn empowering. Let me, what do they say? Make your mess your message. And I've always loved that. I haven't Same. heard that one before, but I that, like that one a lot. That's a good one. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, hey, if, if you're going through something and um, might as well embrace it, which is a process, but might as well just kind of be real about it because trying to pretend like it's not there or trying to step out into the world every day, pretending like um, things aren't hard when maybe they are, is really exhausting. And life's not going to be constant joy. No. I, I don't, maybe for some people somewhere it is, but I'm pretty sure the goal for me is just to add a little bit more joy more often, mm -hmm. connect with people more huge, often. Huge. And the things that I'm struggling with, find ways to just struggle with it less and get rid of it because when you release all of this that you've been struggling with, there's so much more time to, to find some new things that will bring you joy mm -hmm. where clearly the things that you're struggling with don't bring you joy. That's why you're yes. struggling with them. And yes. And it brings people into your life where you can be real about that stuff. Yes. And that's that's one of the most beautiful gifts I think that we can give ourselves. So be real about the things that otherwise you're hiding in an attempt to be slightly different than maybe yep. who you really are. That's what you're wrong about. I th yes. I think we, we might have solved everything. Today, I think Kurt. so. I, th I mean, that's what we got to in the podcast. I think I was I was pretty 
when it comes to some of the stuff that I've struggled with. I was I was potentially more vulnerable with you than I have been with anybody else. And I might add that I knew Brian Pyatt of Care 11 before <laughs> anybody else did. Way back, he was just some little kid showing up to St. Cloud State, wide-eyed. He thought I was cool or something. Yeah. I don't know. But that's... You were the guy that knew everything at the radio station at mm. KVSC. You trained me in. My first, like, broadcasting gig at St. Cloud State was, was with you. And then you just soared past me as big time Minneapolis true. superstar TV guy. It's not true. Here we are okay. talking on the podcast. Yep. Now, now you're on my podcast. So. I know, see, look at it. It's all circles back. It's all full circle. Brian, thank you for joining me today. And thank you so much thanks, for having Brian. me. It was truly a, proud, a pleasure. Thank this you. Was awesome. Thanks for listening to People I Know Show. As always, links are in the show notes for the People I Know Show Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube accounts. Please, when you go there, click subscribe or follow whatever button it gives you so that you can stay connected to this podcast, some of the photos and videos and everything else related that I end up sharing. If you like the show, please reach out, tell me something about it, post on one of the social media accounts, your review, review the podcast and Apple Podcasts, whatever there is that you think you could do. I would just be grateful to have an opportunity to know who's out there, to know who's listening, and to know if I have done something here with this conversation or other conversations that has impacted you in some way. So please take a moment to reach out to me. The one way that I haven't mentioned yet that you can reach out, you can do it by email, sending it to me, Kurt Karstensen, using the email address, peopleiknowshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.